Hello, everyone. My name is Jamie Bassance. I'm the Visitor Eng Engagement Coordinator at Soldiers Memorial Military Museum. Thank you for attending the Battle of St. Louis. Um, before I introduce the speakers and we get rolling, I just have a, a few logistical things to go over. Um, First of all, uh, we're actually getting back into some uh, in-person programming now. We've got a mix of virtual and in-person programming. Um, so Thursday nights at the Missouri History Museum, uh, there, there's something every week. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll mention the next couple of virtual programs that we have coming up at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the presentation. Uh, if you have questions, you can submit them through the Q&A box. Uh, I'll be looking there for questions, so please use that instead of the chat box. Um, depending on how many questions we get, hopefully we can get to them all, uh, but just please be aware, depending on how many questions we get, we might not be able to get to them all. Today's presentation is being recorded and it will be uploaded to the Missouri Historical Society's YouTube channel um, a couple days after uh, today. And finally, not finally, um, Closed captioning is available automatically on Zoom now. Uh, you can find that uh, on your little toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, finally, your feedback is always important to us. Uh, after you close out the webinar, uh, your browser should automatically open a short survey about the program, uh, and we'd appreciate it if you'd be willing to take a couple minutes to fill that out. That feedback is always valuable to us. Uh, and once the program gets rolling, I'll add um, a couple of uh, links into the chat box. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a member of the Missouri Historical Society, we appreciate the support. That allows us to put on programs like these. Uh, if you want to subscribe to our newsletter to find out about other programs like these, uh, and also to the uh, Missouri Historical Society's YouTube channel, where you can find uh, all of these online programs that we've put on before. Uh, so with, with all of that out of the way, uh, I'll introduce today's uh, speakers. We've got Robert Moore, a local author and historian, and uh, Jeff Gillerano, who's the director of the um, the Center for French Colonial Life in St. Genevieve. Uh, and they've actually got an exhibit up right now that, uh, that connects with this topic. Uh, would you like to say a little bit about that, Jeff? Thank you, Jamie. Yes, uh, right now uh, we have an exhibit entitled Saving St. Louis, uh, the um, St. Genevieve Militia and the Battle of Fort San Carlos. Uh, at our exhibit facility in St. Genevieve. It's going to be open uh, at least until uh, the spring of 2023. And we hope you come down and see it. It, it really, uh, it tells the story of the battle uh, to some extent, but a large part of what we're dealing with is the nature of the militia and the contribution of the 60 St. Genevieve militiamen who went up and helped uh, save St. Louis in 1780. Thank you. Um, so, and I, I suppose I should mention uh, the, the Battle of St. Louis and the Battle of Fort San Carlos are kind of alternate names for the same event, as far as I understand. Um, so, uh, Robert, uh, you were going to give us a, uh, before the discussion gets rolling, uh, you were going to give us a kind of an introduction to the event? Yeah, I thought it might be helpful just to uh, give people a little bit of background, especially if they haven't read about the battle before and, uh, you know, would like to know more about it. So I put together a little program that uh, might provide a little bit of information about the battle itself. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I, I worked for the National Park Service for 40 years and retired uh, just last year from the Gateway Arch where I worked for 29 years. Uh, so the, the battle is quite familiar to me and was part of the story that we told at the Arch and particularly because part of it happened near uh, the, the land that the Park Service owns, especially at the old courthouse. This particular painting was created to uh, give a perspective of the battle from where the Park Service land is uh, near Luther Ely Smith Square, which is just across the street from the old courthouse. So in this scene, uh, which is looking to the southwest, you can uh, look just to the very left of the picture and see the Fort San Carlos Tower over there that figured so prominently in the battle. Uh, but this is a nice view, which kind of gives an impression of what it would be like uh, to be fighting from the trenches that were dug uh, 
uh, I tend to doubt actually when I'm looking at this now and what we're going to talk about in the next few minutes if the uh, tribal uh, combatants uh, who were with the British ever got as close to this battle line as is, is shown in this picture. They're, they're pretty close there. Uh, I doubt if they got that close, but we'll discuss why in, in just a minute. Let me just run through this and uh, spend maybe five or 10 minutes and then we can kind of get back to the um, to having your questions answered. And to, so this battle was the result of a three-pronged British plan to try to assault the Mississippi River Valley and take over the valley from the Spanish. Now, a lot of people might get confused. Why are we talking about the Spanish when St. Louis was founded by French speaking people and uh, it's well known that the, the French were in this area for uh, since uh, 1699 when the first settlement was created at Cahokia. Uh, the main reason was because in 1763, at the end of the French and Indian War, the uh, French had secretly tr uh, ceded the land west of the Mississippi River to the Spanish, uh, their cousins, uh, Bourbon, uh, family that was on the throne of Spain. So you had uh, the entire area to the west of the Mississippi now being administered by the Spanish, uh, whereas the British had taken over the area uh, to the east. And of course, George Rogers Clark's campaigns for the Americans had taken key installations and towns in this region. So the British were, were not able to uh, function in this region. So they had uh, an overriding interest in trying to try to subdue uh, these towns and to get the uh, Americans and even the Spanish uh, out of uh, their purview here. Uh, as it turns out, the three-pronged uh, attack plan never transpired. And instead, there were uh, two groups uh, of traders whose names are uh, listed here, Hesse, Ducharme, uh, Langlade, who set out from two different uh, locations and gathered uh, people from several different Indian tribes to attack St. Louis. Altogether, there were about 700, Amer uh, 50 American Indians and 24 traders and Angeji who were in the force that was initially recruited to attack St. Louis. And then they added a few more, so probably between 200 and 250 from the Sac and Fox nations. Uh, and they were somewhat reluctant to join the attack because they did some business with the St. Louis traders. And they thought, well, if we lose in this attack, uh, we will be out of the picture in terms of uh, being able to conduct trade with the St. Louisans. I worked in a, a 3D modeling program to come up with a few scenes to try to visualize. The first one I wanted to show you was the defending force in real numbers so that you actually will see how many uh, people were on the St. Louis side of the battle lines in May of 1780. So the governor, Spanish Lieutenant Governor, who was here in St. Louis was the person who was really in charge of the militia forces that fought in the battle and also the uh, professional Spanish soldiers who were stationed in the area. We know he had, and, and it says here, only five cannon. Uh, as you'll find out that I believe was very instrumental in the victory of the forces in St. Louis over their attackers because their attackers had no artillery at all. So we know at least they had five cannons um, and they were, as it says in the legend here, um, two six pounders and three four pounders. And in a second, I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. These are the Spanish regular troops, a little primitive in the execution of the drawing, but at least it gives you an idea of how many there were. This is the entire complement. So there had been uh, some 
men, a corporal and six, at a, a place called Fort Don Carlos, which was on the Missouri River. It was up near where Fort Bell Fountain is today, if you're familiar with that. And uh, the governor recalled these soldiers to come to St. Louis when it was learned that uh, the town might be attacked. In St. Louis is the, the second line of soldiers. Those were the ones who were stationed in St. Louis, 15 of them. Uh, there was a drummer and uh, also an officer that was here. And then uh, our rescuers, uh, St. Genevieve, had another complement of Spanish soldiers, which are shown in the very front row there. And they came up the river, uh, a lieutenant and 12 men, uh, and they helped to augment the force that was here in St. Louis. The battle itself was really not fought by these soldiers though. They were kept in reserve, as I'll show you in a minute. So they were not in the battle lines, which seems a little strange to us today that the professional soldiers who would have the most experience were kind of sidelined during the battle. The battle itself was fought by civilian militia that had been recruited in St. Louis and in St. Genevieve. So uh, here we see an actual uh, number of St. Louis militia that was involved in the battle. Uh, this augmented by another kind of more elite force, which was the uh, cavalry unit that DeLeva established and was quickly uh, gotten rid of after uh, the battle. Uh, they had some special uniforms though, red uniforms with uh, blue facings, as you can see here. Um, they might have looked very impressive, but uh, for the most part, they probably didn't have enough horses. So having a cavalry unit in this particular part of the country probably wasn't the best idea. Uh, but this uh, is a number, another number of uh, men who were added to the fighting force. And then we had our uh, St. Genevieve militia, who you see represented here, uh, this, the 60 uh, militia, and also uh, the others who we saw in the other pictures. So at any rate, that's uh, kind of a rundown of the force that uh, received this attack in 1780. Back a minute to the attackers. The Native Americans included members of several tribes, which you can see listed at the top of this slide. I won't bother to read them all off because um, I, I want to try to make this as uh, short as possible, but you probably can read them faster than I can uh, speak them. Um, one of the most important things I think that we should understand from this is that in the past, a lot of historians who have talked about the battle have made it seem as though there were British soldiers who were leading these uh, American Indian uh, attackers. And for the most part, from what we're learning now, it's believed that uh, there were traders along uh, with the force, a very small number who had some military experience. For the most part, different Native peoples would have been led by their own chiefs in battle. And uh, two of the chiefs who we see uh, mentioned here, Wapasha and Machquis, uh, were in, in, extremely important and probably the main leaders of this force that attacked St. Louis. It was an almost a completely Native force. Um, here we see a picture I took um, in Yorktown when I, well, it's a little before I actually worked there, but um, in 1981 when they had the 200th anniversary of the battle. And it gives you a little bit of an idea of what it might've been like to do uh, trench fighting. And in this case, I chose pictures I had of the French soldiers. Uh, so you would get an idea of uh, perhaps if somebody you know had enough time to uh, actually don a uniform what they might have looked like. Altogether, the defending garrison that Governor DeLeva had was 310 men against a force, as we mentioned earlier, there was about a thousand um, native people who came down to attack St. Louis. One of the decisive things about the battle was the tower that DeLeva had uh, kind of forced St. Louisans to build in anticipation of a possible attack. 
we don't know a lot about the tower in terms of, you know, it's uh, different historians have different takes on it, but it is thought to have been about 30 feet tall, which is what's depicted in this uh, artistic rendering uh, that I did in SketchUp. You can see the trench below it. And this is where we believe De Leyva placed his artillery, his five uh, cannons that he had. And I'll show you why that was uh, a, a very smart thing to do in just a moment. As I mentioned earlier, the Spanish regular troops were not in the trenches. Where they were was at the so-called Spanish government house that was kind of centrally located in the, the town. So if you imagine today, if you think about being downtown and the trenches ran along 4th Street, right in front of the, uh, the old courthouse. Um, and then imagine where the south leg of the Gateway Arch is today, because that's about where this house stood. And that is where the Spanish regulars were. You see, I've illustrated the regulars uh, behind the house in the garden area with their tents and the marquee tent for their officers. Um, it, this may have been what the uh, situation looked like at the time. Here we have another view of the house. And it is said that the women and children of the village were clustered on this property and perhaps even many of them taking refuge in the basement of this house. A couple more pictures of the trenches at Yorktown in 1981 with reenactors. Um, I think what's important about these views is just it gives you kind of a uh, idea of the time period. Um, I may sk skip over this anecdote. I, I think the main thing I wanted to convey was the huge amount of um, casualties in the battle. About 14% was suffered by the um, St. Louisans. We really don't know how many casualties the attacking force had, um, but you know, having 53 out of 700 people is uh, quite high casualty rate, uh, especially for this time period during the Revolutionary War. So the St. Louisans suffered quite a bit uh, as a result of this attack. Here we see uh, the approach routes of the British coming down the Mississippi River to St. Louis. A smaller force was split off, so the full 1,000 Native people was not attacking, all attacking St. Louis. There was a smaller force that went down the east side of the river and attacked Cahokia, where there were American forces under George Rogers Clark. Uh, that attack, we believe, was beaten off quite um, easily, but it kept the Americans busy, so they were not able to aid the uh, militia and regulars that were on the west side of the river. The battle itself, uh, was an assault on not only that 30 foot watchtower, but also lengthy entrenchments that St. Louisans dug. If you could imagine a trench running uh, in this whole arc and with the number of uh, feet of entrenchments that were probably dug at least as deep as the ones that you saw in the photograph a few minutes ago, uh, you get an idea of how much work was done in preparation for a possible assault on St. Louis in 1780. The assault itself came from the north or, or northwest. Um, it was not able to maintain any kind of a close distance to the battle line uh, because of the artillery in the tower. And so there was uh, an attempted assault, um, but they were driven off fairly quickly uh, to retire to a distance which was too far really for their uh, small arms to have any effect on the soldiers in the trenches. So uh, the battle was somewhat short. Um, the attackers before they were able to attack the trenches, however, came upon some civilians who were out in the farm fields and those people were killed. That's where the casualties took place, uh, were in the farm fields prior to the battle itself. Here we see a schematic of the entire town of St. Louis, its layout in 1780. And the big circle you see is a 1200 yard radius from the watchtower. 
that's how far a cannon could shoot of the type that they had, uh, the six and four pounders at the time. You can see that it covers nearly the entire uh, scope of the town of St. Louis. So the artillerymen in the tower would be able to hit any point within this radius and an attacking force coming in would have to um, try to avoid being killed by this artillery. Now I've made a second smaller circle. This is the uh, radius by which uh, grape shot could be fired out of a cannon, uh, 300 yards. So uh, this encompasses how far they would be able to shoot with that uh, smaller um, size projectile. Uh, on here where the regular troops were, the church. This is where the modern day um, uh, church is downtown. The old cathedral is right on this block. And this is where the watchtower was, which today is at the corner uh, in the actually in the middle of the intersection of Walnut and Fourth Streets. Uh, so that location is still uh, in existence and still well known. So the visibility that the tower gave in the field of fire for the artillery gave the St. Louisans a real advantage. And just really quickly, because I'm running out of how long I promised I would talk here. Um, the six pounders, uh, the size of them, what they looked like. This is the type of solid shot they would fire. So you wouldn't want to be hit with these. They didn't explode, but they could bounce around. And if you got hit with them, they would take an arm or a leg off or, or, or kill you and, uh, if they hit your body or your head. Grape shot, which fired 300 yards, was a group of smaller projectiles, each of them probably about an inch and a half in diameter, that when it was fired, they would spread out in all directions like a gigantic shotgun. Now the attackers, well, again, we're still talking about the, the main uh, small arm used by the Spanish was uh, the infantry musket of the, kind of a model 1757. But muskets at that time could only fire effectively about 100 yards sometimes up to 150, depending on the, the day and the, and the soldier. But as you see, the uh, grape shot can uh, travel 300 yards and the small arms can only fire 100 yards. So you have an advantage if you've got artillery. Even some of the uh, attacking force that might've had rifles could only fire 300 yards with them. So solid shots are beyond the range of their rifles. And here again, we see some schematics of that idea of range. Wherever they were on the outside of the entrenchments, they could be hit by solid shot. And uh, artillery was, was fairly accurate at that time. There's kind of a myth that artillery wasn't accurate. Uh, it would become more accurate in later years, but a good uh, artilleryman could place a, a shot pretty much where they wanted it to go at the time. Uh, so this is the, the main thing I wanted to show that it's my own personal belief that the construction of the watchtower and the cannons placed there are what were decisive in the battle um, against allowing this gigantic force, much larger force of uh, enemy combatants to enter the village of St. Louis and uh, gain dominance uh, in this battle. Uh, so I'll leave it there for now. We, I've got some other pictures I can show later, depending on what uh, questions we get. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, so I, I think at, at this point, uh, Jeff had some uh, some questions that he wanted to pose to Bob. Uh, I think uh, we can also start getting audience questions rolling in. Um, if, if you have any at this stage, uh, just as a reminder, please do use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar there. Um, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, I'd like to compliment Bob on the work he did on this presentation. I love his illustrations. It's uh, and I think also the, the use of the, the photographs from uh, Yorktown in 1981, uh, which I, I remember 1981 too. Um, 
<laughs> but the uh, the fact that uh, the it really does give you a good idea of what it looked like because French and Spanish professional soldiers in this period both have white uniforms and that was uh, I think really appropriate. But Bob, I'm also intrigued and I've really been struck by your analysis of the, the importance of the artillery and the illustrations that go with it. Um, I think we might want to also mention the, the guys from St. Genevieve brought uh, at least two swivel guns up from St. Genevieve with them, which uh, Deleva had specifically asked them. And those are out somewhere in the trenches, correct? Right, right. I would think so, yeah. Yeah, which even if they are not reach have having the actual reach they're certainly adding to the noise um because even a swivel gun makes a a, a dandy sound when when you uh, when you fire it and that's part of what's going on here if i'm correct that that my understanding is that the attacking force the british and their native allies weren't expecting St. Louis to be ready. They were thinking, am I correct that they were thinking they were going to surprise the, the town and not find it so actively defended? Yes, exactly. Uh, they thought it would be a cakewalk, you know, that uh, it was just an unprotected village because there had never been any fortifications at St. Louis. So when they arrived at the town and found that there was a, a, a complete 18th century trench system, and, and a watchtower with artillery in it. I mean, it had to be a huge shock. And that certainly it's been a huge shock, but also extremely discouraging. On, on the other hand, I think one, one can argue that uh, the, they were game and uh, uh, particularly uh, the Sioux and uh, a couple of the other groups uh, went ahead and attacked nonetheless, moved forward, and they did suffer some casualties, correct? Yes, yes, we, we just uh, don't know how many. I don't think anyone recorded or else the, uh, the paper that it was recorded on just hasn't survived to the yeah. present day. Well, I think that there's one British report that mentions a handful, uh, but the, uh, that's, that takes some chutzpah, going ahead and, and, and attacking a prepared position, even if you are outnumbering the, the people in the prepared position, because that, you know, uh, a, a trench to fight from and the towers, you know, force multiplier. Uh, but uh, speaking of the tower, that's one of, I think, intriguing parts of this. Yeah, you the way you described it of, of uh, Deleba forcing uh, the uh, St. Louis folks to uh, help with building the tower, including financial support. But I think it's important to mention he also paid for a large part of it out of his own pocket. And um, you know, here's a guy who he's investing his money, his life, he's sick at the time, he, and his, and afterwards, he doesn't really get the credit that many people argue that today that he deserves for saving the, what, what happened? Why, why did people in St. Louis, you know, certainly by the early 19th century, there are accounts that uh, are, are very derogatory about him. Uh, why did they uh, kind of uh, trash his memory in, in this situation? Well, <clears throat> well we know that um, Deleba was a military man. He had the rank of captain in the Spanish army. Uh, so he had previous military experience which uh, was very helpful in what he tried to do, what he uh, 
you know, tried to force the St. Louisans to do to prepare for this onslaught. In terms of his um, likability, he doesn't seem to have been an extremely likable man. But George uh, Rogers Clark liked him. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think the problem was he was very inflexible. And the St. Louisans had gotten away with a lot from the time that uh, the city was founded in 1764 until 16 years later when this attack took place. Uh, For the first six years of the town's existence, there weren't any administrators here. Uh, So they pretty much got to do what they wanted to do. Um, You know, they did have people like, um, um, I'm trying to think of his name, it'll come to me. Uh, who were influential in, uh, you know, setting up the the land, the way the land was distributed, things like that. But it was kind of a business and economic free-for-all in early St. Louis. And the earlier Spanish governors wanted to just keep a status quo and keep things um, on an even keel with the St. Louisans. They weren't there to really disrupt things. But uh, Deleva came in and he was pretty inflexible. He tried to institute really strict policies about things that the St. Louisans had gotten away with. And those included things like um, the way that they distributed Indian presents uh, that were outside the realm of their actual economic um, distribution, um, trying to eliminate Indian slavery entirely. All the things he did sound really good to us today. It's just that at the time, uh, St. Louisans didn't feel the same way. And uh, there was a, a large number of people apparently who really didn't like DeLeva. So it's not even uh, just later historians who have besmirched his memory. It was people at the time, even participants in the battle who didn't like him and wrote some really scurrilous things about DeLeva, um, you know, right after the battle took place. Even, uh, I guess we can mention that DeLeva died about a month after the battle. He was very sick during the battle and then he, um, he and both, both he and his wife died, uh, leaving both his daughters to uh, seek out charity and they ended up in a, a convent over in, in Spain. Um, so, Anyway, he was not liked, and St. Louisans felt even more put upon by the fact that he was, you know, trying to squeeze labor out of them, trying to squeeze money out of them to build these fortifications. And so a lot of really uh, untrue things were said about him after the battle. So it's been interesting through history that there's been this give and take among historians who have these different views of Deleba, and he's remained a controversial figure even to this day. So my presentation may not um, give people the impression of how uh, hated he was by St. Louisans and how they were willing to uh, say things like he fired on his own uh, people on inhabitants of St. Louis with the cannons and a number of other things were, were said at the time about the labor that were were not kind. Well, there's an, and also it maybe it's related to that thing about firing on on their own people. As you mentioned, there are these people who are caught outside of the fortifications. And my understanding is that that Deleva refused repeated requests to couldn't we make sorties to to go out and uh, try to rescue them because there were people being uh, tortured and killed by uh, it probably in part as a tactic to try to draw them out where their smaller numbers uh, would not hold up well against you know the larger Native American force and he very steadfastly and very reasonably said, no, we can't do that. We have to stay in within our fortifications. And yeah, people lost friends and relatives. And, and I, I can see how that would have 
potentially have uh, a, a negative impact on how people felt about it. But uh, it, it is unfortunate, but it, yeah, and when you call them inflexible, I think one of the interesting things there is that I would call him really professional because he's kind of reflective of just like the militia of that period. You know, this is, this is after a certain time that the, the quote unquote bourbon reforms had happened on, in the Spanish uh, empire under Carlos III, where they were improving the militia system, they were improving their military forces. And the, the Spanish were actually pretty good at uh, what they, they did and, and very professional and good soldiers and even including the militia, which they heavily relied on, not just here, but lots of, of their uh, parts of their empire. And uh, actually you would think you can make the argument that St. Louisans were pretty darn lucky that they had a professional like that in charge at that point. Yeah, you know, I think you and I are uh, Deleba partisans, though, so we're, we're, we don't have a fair and balanced uh, presentation in terms of uh, Deleba. I, I was while you were talking, I was thinking of one other thing I, I didn't mention that I should, uh, which again goes to his, um, I, I think, acute uh, understanding of military situations. Uh, I said it was puzzling why he put the Spanish regulars at the uh, government house but it was centrally located. So if there was a break in the line, if uh, the attacking force got through someplace, those soldiers could be sent on the double to that location to help bolster um, that location. They were seen as a, a force of last resort. And even if the lines yeah. collapsed and they all kind of came in toward the Spanish government house, the regulars would be able to help defend that. So I think that's what uh, Deleba had in mind. He wanted his professional soldiers to be able to run to any gaps or help with the final defense if um, that was necessary. They were a reliable reserve and, a, you know, a reserve that he could count on. And, um, you know, and the other thing, speaking of, of dividing your forces, we didn't talk too much about Cahokia, but the fact that, uh, do you think that it, it might potentially have made a difference if the, uh, the British and Native American forces hadn't been divided and tried attacking two different targets simultaneously and instead concentrated on one or the other? It, it might have, but I think strategically what the, uh, the leaders on the British side were worried about was that it would have been possible for if the Americans realized what was happening to ferry some of their soldiers across the river and help bolster the uh, numbers in St. Louis. So, so it, it, it did make sense from their point of view to keep those guys at least tied down. Right. So, okay. That, yeah, I can buy that. We've also been talking about the tower itself. And, you know, one of the questions I think we had is, well, why did they go to the trouble of throwing up a stone tower in what? Took, took them about a, a month to build that? Um, and why not a, uh, you know, a typical North American timber blockhouse or something like that? But why this tower? Uh, and I think you had some interesting thoughts on that. Well, I don't, I don't know for sure. I could only conjecture, but uh, this is the type of fortification that Deleba would have been more uh, familiar with. Um, and they're, they're built like uh, windmills, actually. If you see the windmills in, um, in Spain, uh, even the famous group that uh, is associated with uh, Don Quixote, um, they look almost yeah. exactly like these uh, windmills. 
uh, or rather like this uh, stone watchtower uh, would have looked. Uh, if you'd like, I could throw up a couple of pictures because I have some images of the watchtower that were made contemporaneously. And th this is one of the more interesting ones. This is a, a map that was created by a man named Beck in 1823. And by 1823, mm -hmm. most of the Spanish fortifications had been torn down. Uh, but what he illustrated on the map was not only the existing street grid in St. Louis, but he also illustrated the past fortifications that the Spanish built. So here's our uh, watchtower right here, the DeLeva Watchtower. That's, that's Fort San Carlos. That is Fort San Carlos. And this is a later watchtower that was built in 1797. There were actually uh, three more of these built that were surrounding the town. And they built a wooden blockhouse uh, that was off to the north or the southwest uh, of the town. Like all um, early maps of St. Louis, uh, on this map, north is, is this way, over to the right. Uh, so this is west, the river's down here at the bottom, which is uh, to the east. But at any rate, um, he actually illustrated these towers. This one would have still been standing when the map was done. Uh, Fort San Carlos was torn down four years earlier in 1819. So that was no longer standing. But it's interesting how he shows a uh, uh, the the roof on it, and you can see the dormers, and there's also um, wind either windows or gun ports. Mm -hmm. uh, so it gives you some idea of what the tower would have looked like. And Beck was in St. Louis when the tower was still standing, uh, that had been torn down four years earlier. So he did uh, personally know what it looked like. Now here's a photograph, daguerreotype taken by Thomas Easterly in 1852. And this is on the northern uh, riverfront um, about where Laclede's Landing is today. And this also shows a tower very much like the Fort San Carlos Tower. Uh, but what's different about this is this was built to be a windmill. This was made uh, constructed by a man named Roy in the colonial period but it was not built to be a fortification. It was built to be a windmill. Uh, it's often mistaken for a Spanish fortification. And in fact, this photograph is often published saying that it's a fort, but uh, it wasn't. But it does give you an idea. It's the same kind of construction, the same colonial people who built Fort San Carlos built this windmill. It's what they were familiar with. It well, it's kind of a, it, it, there's also that uh, Spanish uh, practice of building coastal fortification and watchtowers just like, very similar to this. Again, stuff that the label would have been familiar with and but in, in you know islands that they own and the coast of Spain and, and Menorca and, and there's still these watchtowers uh, which um, uh, other other uh, European powers built similar things at the time and they worked very well the uh, I you know there's the uh, the tower in Mortello, Corsica, that the British have trouble reducing when they attack it in 1794. And after that, they start building them and they call them uh, Martello Towers. Uh, <laughs> the, they misnamed, they, you know, a, a, a slurring of the, the term Mortello. Uh, but that these, going back to the I think 15th, 16th century, they're, they're building these watchtowers wherever they're close to a body of water. And you can argue that's certainly what St. Louis is. And, uh, but it, it, it's intriguing. They're building what they're familiar with. And, uh, and it was, was not 
entirely finished by the time of the battle, correct? Right, that's why this roof, the, the uh, conical roof would probably not have been in place in 1780, but was probably added later as we see on the Beck map. And we can also see it, by the way, on, on the uh, banknote, 1817 banknote mm -hmm. of St. Louis, which shows the earliest known view of the town. You can see the tower right here. Here's a little closer view of it. So you see the, the tower with the conical roof on it. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is this is also, uh, this type of tower is in the French um, lexicon of, of building styles also. There's a tower very much like it in uh, Quebec province in Canada that was built in the 1700s. So it's very possible that people in St. Louis would have also been aware of this type of architecture. Yeah, like I say, it's, it's lots of different European powers are, are using these. It's, okay, here, here's one for pure speculation for you. Who was the labor using for gunners? Yeah, who knows, maybe. It, you know, maybe. It, it's not exactly, especially a muzzle loading uh, artillery piece. Yeah, it, it's helpful if you have a little familiarity with the, pro, uh, the process and the characteristics of what you're playing with. Who was he using for gunners? Well, he, he might have uh, been drilling and training people uh, as a lead up because they were building all these fortifications. He certainly knew they were going to have to use the artillery. Mm -hmm. I think it's a famous quote by Baron von Steuben during the Revolutionary War. If you uh, give me five good infantrymen, I can turn them into artillerymen in, in two weeks. <laughs> so, you yeah. know. That was the attitude at the time, although, you know, obviously the uh, ar artillerists in the various armies around the world were very proud of what they could do. And certainly, uh, you know, well-trained artillery crew, especially with a, a good gunner uh, and officer would be able to pretty much put their uh, solid shot on, on, right on a target after about three shots. So, um, I'm just thinking that he he trained up people who were promising, who were in the militia companies, to be able to uh, fulfill the role of artillerists. Yeah, and and again, he did he did have time to prepare. So uh, it's just like the the question about I know the Saint Genevieve guys got there about ten days or so before the the battle and the question, well, what did they do during those 10 days? Well, I, I Carl Eckberg, I uh, wrote a really nice piece, which I really appreciate that you shared with me where his, his argument was that, well, they probably went to work improving the position, you know, digging the trenches out further. And, and, uh, you know, you, whenever you get in a prepared position, what's your first thing that you do, will you make it better? And uh, so there was time to, to keep working on this and, and it's arguably the labor used that time really well. Yeah, yeah one, I was just remembering one point we didn't get a chance to make, which was about the augmentation of the soldiers who were here and the militia that was here by the St. Genevieve people. And um, I think that you and I have been chatting about the idea of, you know, how many men would have been in the trenches and how much space would be between them. Because yeah. it would be nothing like what you saw in those photos I showed, because there were so few people and they had to actually uh, deal with trenches that went all the way around the town because they didn't know where the attack was coming from. So certainly they could have massed more troops in the area where the firepower was hitting, which I estimate was kind of where the, that first picture we had near the old courthouse in that area where the attack was coming. So they could have massed more of the soldiers there, but without being augmented by those 60 uh, militiamen and the regulars from St. Genevieve, they wouldn't have had 
uh, enough men to spread out through the trenches as it was. I think we were guessing they'd be something like uh, four or five yards apart with just a single guy, uh, you know? So, I mean, the trenches were not full of people because they didn't have right. enough people really to defend this huge perimeter. Yeah, like it's it's not like Yorktown. It's it's certainly not like World War One trenches. It's, um, but one of the other things I th in, intriguing is, and and again, you know, I I I really enjoyed that piece that Dr. Eckberg did, uh, where he actually identified about. 20 or so, so about a third of the guys from St. Genevieve who went up to St. Louis. And they're mostly uh, voyageurs and hunters. And, you know, A, guys who knew how to use firearms and use them effectively, but also B, arguably, at least some of those guys are using rifles, perhaps. And, uh, you know, you get a little more range, you get a little more accuracy, uh, but also particularly the, um, and, and am I correct that for the most part, the Spanish uh, militia had to supply their own weapons? That they weren't issued out of the King's stores the way, say, like the French used to, or Were, were you asking me or? I, I was asking you. I thought you were yes. just telling us. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, yeah, I was asking for your impression. I, I don't know. That. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think a lot of people would have probably wanted to say they were hunters in the group. So anyone yeah. that had a rifled uh, weapon was going to choose that over, uh, I, I think, a uh, military firearm, uh, they're not going to have as rapid a rate of fire, but certainly a lot more accurate. So add more range. Um, but I think that that it, it's interesting, I think the because there were, I think oh, I want to say something in the range of about 150 or so militia members I uh, you know, who had taken the oath and were signed on the rolls in St. Genevieve and would have been drilling and everything. And they only brought 60 of them. And, you know, how did they choose those 60? And the argument being that, well, yeah, you take your best shots, your toughest younger guys, the voyagers and hunters and some field hands. And um, I partly because they are probably going to perform better than some, you know, pudgy old merchant. Uh, and, but also that uh, if they don't make it, uh, they're not going to be having, uh, their loss is not going to have the same kind of impact on the economy and on families and the community. And, and uh, I mean, to be brutal about it, but um, I, I, I think we're not being unreasonable in saying that, that uh, these well-chosen 60 men uh, made a considerable difference in the outcome. Right, yeah, agreed, agreed totally. We've got an audience question that I want to be sure to get to before we run yes. out of time here. Yes, please. Was, a, was there a follow-up attack? Did the British and Native Americans simply turn around and head back to Prairie de Chen in and the northern Illinois area after the first failed attempt? They did. And then uh, what's interesting is that uh, the militia actually had to be restrained again by Deleva because they wanted to uh, follow them immediately in their footsteps and attack their, their regard as they left the area. Uh, and the label wouldn't let them do that. So he was accused right. of cowardice and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, but they did mount a full-scale attack on Fort St. Joseph uh, that next winter. Um, I'm forgetting now if it was in December 
might have been in January. It was six months, seven months later. Um, Fort St. Joseph is about where Gary, Indiana is today. It was a rallying point for uh, British traders and for uh, the tribes. And at any rate, that uh, post was attacked by St. Louisans who hiked overland up there in the middle of the winter and uh, and made an attack on it. So, thank you. Yeah, the and, and actually the the British were planning a follow up attack and were we found evidence in Canadian archives about where they were providing gifts to some of the same groups, some of the same group, Sioux, particularly the Sioux, um, uh, to prepare them and keep their, their interest in allegiance. And they just never quite got around to it. It didn't work out, but they were planning on it. They were intending to try again. I guess uh, I have one question that I'd love to ask before we kind of before we wrap up, uh, and that is when I'm introducing this topic to visitors at Soldiers Memorial, we, we have a small display on the battle at Soldiers Memorial. Uh, I, I usually uh, call it uh, a, a battle of the Revolutionary War, but the sense that I'm getting here is that this didn't have a lot of strategic bearing on uh, you know the colonial effort for independence, uh, and and that the the American Revolution. War and this battle are both smaller pieces of the larger story of, uh, you know, competing imperial uh, European interests. Is that an accurate uh, read or, or, or was this battle somehow important uh, to the American Revolution? It's an interesting question. I, I tend to fall on the side, I think, more of what you were, you know, your latter statement about imperial empires clashing. Uh, but, you know, Deleba spent most of the two years that he, uh, before the battle, uh, in great friendship with George Rogers Clark and supplying him with just about all of his needs. Uh, so, you know, talk about aiding the, the enemy, you know, I mean, that was one of the main reasons why the British could justify an attack on St. Louis was that the Spanish and particularly the Spanish Lieutenant Governor was uh, providing the aid that the Americans needed. Uh, the Virginians in particular, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who was the governor, felt that it was important to, uh, to take the British lands in the West. And he had sent George Rogers Clark out this way to do that. Um, Francisco de Leyva was one of the reasons he was able to succeed. And so from that perspective, I'd say, yes, it's, it's definitely a part of the American Revolution. Um, it's usually talked about as being the westernmost battle right. of the Revolutionary War. And since American troops, Virginia troops were engaged, uh, I would say that it, it definitely fits into you know, anybody's scenario about the war. It, as you say, it wasn't extremely strategically important to, you know, either the ultimate victory of American forces or to the uh, uh, overall strategy of anyone in the war. But of course it comes into play later on, which I, I kind of don't like, you know, how historians are always looking at it and saying, well, gee, you know, we couldn't have made the Louisiana purchase if it wasn't for this battle. and of course, it, it we, really we'd all be, to... be saying A and drinking Molson's right now if it hadn't been for, uh, yeah, 60 guys from right. Cincinnati. That's a bit much. Right. Okay. But, yeah. uh, but I, I, I agree with you. I, I think it's especially given when you think about how it ties into the what George Rogers Clark and the Virginians were doing in the Illinois country and taking control of that from the British and how much, let's face it, a very large part of the reasons why the Americans rebelled was in order to gain access for expanding westward at the 
at the expense of the Native American people that uh, I lived in this region. And I, yeah, it's, it's like you, you can't just ask a sideshow and it doesn't matter. But so it's somewhere in that range in between we'd all be drinking Molson's and nah, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> okay. it's somewhere in the middle, I think. Okay. Well, we, we are out of time. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, let's see. And, and thanks to everyone who, uh, who took the time to tune in today. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, when you close out the webinar, uh, your browser should open a short uh, uh, survey if you'd be willing to, uh, to take a look at that. Could I get the, uh, the closing slide here, Bob? Sure. The upcoming programs. So I think uh, July 15th at 6.30 p.m., we've got Miles Davis, The Milieu. Uh, that's presented by the Miles Davis Arts Festival. It's going to be a, a panel discussion that explores the complex dimensions of Miles Davis's life through the prism of his personal development, artistry, and cultural legacy. And then um, July 22nd at 6.30 p.m., we have How the Hattori's Became St. Louisans. Uh, I, I should mention July 24th through October 3rd at Soldiers Memorial, we've got a special exhibit up just 10 weeks. So, so be sure to come down during those 10 weeks if you're interested. It's called uh, Writing a Wrong, Japanese Americans and World War II. And it focuses uh, primarily on the experience of, uh, of incarceration of Japanese Americans during the war. Um, and uh, how the Hattori's became St. Louisans is the first public program we're putting on in connection with that exhibit. Um, uh, it tells the story of uh, Robin Hattori uh, is a local board member of the Japanese American Citizens League. Uh, and her family was held uh, in Arkansas during the war uh, and then wound up settling in St. Louis after afterwards. Uh, so she's going to be giving a general introduction to the topic uh, through the lens of, of her own family's experiences. Uh, so we'd love to we'd love to have anyone who's interested there. Um, don't, uh, yeah, uh, Jeff's Museum, well, <laughs> the, the Center for Coloni French Colonial Life in St. Genevieve, they've got the exhibit up uh, through 2022, you said? Or 2023. 2023, wow, uh, on on this militia's contribution. Um, so be sure to check that out. Is there anything that you wanted to plug, Bob, before we uh, hang up here? No, no, I'm fine. All right. Well, well, thank you both for taking the time today. Thanks again for, to our attendees, and uh, and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you, Jamie. We enjoyed it. I'm glad. <laughs> Y'all have a good one. You too.